All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. If you're here for the forest and wetland adaptation uh, webinar, you're in the right place. We're going to get started here real shortly. Alrighty, <clears throat> so why don't we get started We're right around five past here. Basu Wabanoke Wiek, Migma Ak Talawisi Tyler Everett. Greetings, I am a person of the dawn. I am Migma, and my name is Tyler Everett. Thank you all for joining us today for this second webinar in the USET Forest and Wetland Webinar Training Series. I am the Forest Adaptation Technical Assistant here at United South and Eastern Tribes, or USET. And I'll be hosting today's webinar on adaptive management in brown or black ash wetland forests. Depending on where you're from, you might call it black ash or brown ash. I'm sure some of the presentations will touch on that. Uh, I will share this uh, recording and any slide decks presented during the webinar in a follow-up email, just as I did in the kickoff uh, kickoff webinar. Uh, at this time, I'd like to pass it along to other USET staff on the call. Who are helping uh, support today's webinar. So I'll pass it along first to uh, my supervisor, Dr. Casey Thornbrew. Winnie uh, Kisak, uh, good day everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Thornbrew 
and uh, I'm a citizen of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Um, I live and work uh, out of my home uh, in Mashpee, Massachusetts, um, and I serve as <clears throat> the uh, program manager for uh, USET's uh, Climate Resilience Program. Um, our program uh, provides uh, information and technical support uh, to tribal resource, uh, resource managers and staff uh, for the purpose of adapting to climate change. Uh, we also connect um, staff to partners um, at regional climate adaptation science centers or CAS. And that's kind of my other role uh, to serve as a tribal uh, climate science liaison. I'm um, going to go ahead and, and keep passing along through uh, USET. I am very pleased uh, to pass along to uh, our newest member uh, of our staff um, joining us on, on day one here. Awesome. Um, to Dr. Steph Courtney um, and uh, who'll be uh, serving as the uh, assistant tribal climate science uh, liaison. Um, don't want to steal any more of your thunder, <laughs> Steph. Let me go ahead and pass it to you and, and please feel free to introduce yourself. Yeah, that's most of the good stuff. It is my very first day with you said today. So hi. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Steph Courtney. I just finished my PhD a couple weeks ago uh, at Auburn University in Alabama. And so I've been involved with the Southeast CASC that whole time and met Casey initially through that. Um, so yeah, I know much more about the Southeast than the Northeast. Northeast, it's going to be a good time. Uh, glad to see y'all. Thank awesome. you, Dr. Steph Courtney. Uh, sorry that our first time meetings in a, a live webinar, <laughs> but um, you know, first day of ESET, and we're throwing you in front of the screen already. So it's it's great to have you part of the team, and um, thank you for giving yourself an introduction here today. Uh, I'd also like to give an opportunity to tribal programmatic staff on the call that were not a part of the kickoff webinar, uh, the opportunity to present themselves. If you want to turn your camera on and unmute yourself, uh, if you're tribal programmatic staff, go ahead and give yourself an introduction now. All right, hearing none, I think we can um, pass it along now to, um, oh, I'm sorry, I think that's it for introductions, my bad. Uh, I guess uh, if anyone else has joined the call for the first time today in the webinar series, you can throw your name, title, uh, and uh, you know, the organization or tribal nation that you're affiliated with in the chat. Uh, and then we'll get started with today's uh, agenda. All right, so during the kickoff webinar, our writing reflection was, how do you see the impacts of climate change influencing the work that you do? Uh, we had some excellent reflections shared uh, during the webinar. And then also um, over email, I had a few reflections shared with me. One of the emailed reflections that I received um, was uh, in regard to increased frequency of extreme weather events, in particular, uh, heavy rains and their effect on wild turkey nesting areas. These weather events could play a big role in the weather and whether or not wild turkey have successful brooding offspring. Uh, this person is now wondering uh, what could be done to aid these species like the wild turkey facing these changes. I thought this was a great reflection. Um, and who knows, maybe this question could lead to a project in their community looking closer at the vulnerabilities of the wild turkey. Uh, I wanted to offer anyone the opportunity who was a part of the, the first webinar uh, and those who maybe just joined the call. The, the writing reflection was, um, you know, how do you see the impacts of climate change influencing the work that you do? If you wanna share a reflection now, um, I wanna offer the floor to anyone that would like to reflect on the last uh, kickoff webinar. Hearing none, I uh, want to let you all know we do have the opportunity to share a reflection at the end of the webinar. 
And so uh, after we hear today's content, maybe there'll be some reflections to share at the end. Um, or you can always throw your reflection in the chat and Casey will be monitoring that to share it with everybody. All right. So if you are going to share your reflections, um, that'll get you one step closer to getting these incentive packages. Um, there's a series of nine tasks I've been sharing in an incentive checklist. Uh, and if you are the first to achieve all of those tasks, or you come the closest to achieving all of those ta uh, tasks, you can get the large incentive packages on the left here on the screen. Uh, if you're second to do so, or you are second closest, uh, you receive one of the uh, smaller incentive packages on the right. We also do that for the third person. And so this is all to encourage you to participate, share your reflections. Uh, the large has a backpack, some pancake and waffle mix, coffee and sanitizer, uh, some reusable utensils for your lunch bag, uh, and some maple syrup. Uh, the, smaller tote uh, the smaller incentive package has a, a tote bag, uh, a bottle of maple syrup, travel mug, some coffee and hand sanitizer. Uh, each of these packages contain elements from tribal producers. And so we're trying to encourage that. It's also really great stuff. So I encourage you guys all to uh, try and get those checklist uh, items checked off and, and pursue these packages. To help figure out how exactly to do that, I wanted to just briefly touch on the loyalty card concept again. Uh, we have a series of nine tasks, it serves a similar role as to the you know, loyalty card you get at the gas station. You chip off nine uh, spots and then the 10th one is your free cup of coffee here. If you chip, uh, chip off all nine, uh, the 10th the is this incentive package that we'll, we'll get to you guys. Um, of course, if uh, you're going to do these tasks and writing reflections, you better let me know. So uh, you can send me an email directly at teverett.usetinc.org and I will make sure in my records I have your uh, tasks and writing reflections checked off. This is that checklist that I uh, am referring to, the loyalty card checklist document. Uh, I have a copy of this for everyone in my records, like I said, but um, I also sent this to you in an email so you can keep track of it yourself. <clears throat> At each webinar, you'll get two opportunities to check off the first task, which is just sharing a reflection with the group. It doesn't necessarily need to be a prompted reflection. Um, it may just be whatever comes you know, to your mind. If you wanna share it with the group, um, I'll make sure to keep uh, a track of who's shared a reflection and I'll check it off on your checklist. Um, this will happen at the beginning, which I already did, and also at the end of each webinar, uh, you'll get a chance to share your reflection. Specifically in this webinar, there are three reflections you could uh, share. First is the, the general reflection, which is one thing I learned from today's webinar was. And then beyond that, uh, you also have two other ones. And so number two uh, is in the film site visit addressing Emerald Ash Borer in the Dawnland, Mi'kmaq Nation Vice Chief and Master Basket Maker Richard Silliboy talked about the significance of brown ash to the Wabanoa Key. Uh, what element of significance for the brown ash tree stuck out to you the most and why? And so you could share that reflection, give that some thought while we're going through today's uh, webinar. And then the third is in Tony D'Amato's presentation, Integrated Pest Management of the Emerald Ash Borer and Ash Preservation, numerous strategies for addressing emerald ash borer were shared. These strategies could prove useful in protecting a variety of cultural important species. Uh, whether it be for ash trees or some other significant resource in your own community, how might you share these different strategies that you could employ um, to determine if the com community supports them? Another question to give some thought during today's talk. Here's a quick look at the agenda. Um, we're running a little over on time, so I'm gonna uh, skip this uh, and just say that we're gonna jump into the next uh, item on our agenda, which is the virtual site visit. We've got a pre-recorded site visit uh, addressing Emerald Ash Borer in the Dawnland. And so I'm gonna stop my share here. Pull up the video. We work so fast with the clicks. And with the video, um, we found if you uh, close all your other applications, if you're able to. Um, last week, we had 
no glitches, everything was fine. Um, if you have any trouble uh, on, on your end, um, sometimes closing some of your other applications helps. Yeah, that's a great comment, Casey. And I'm gonna shut my video off. And uh, right before uh, I hit play, I'm gonna mute myself to also help with bandwidth. So if you could do the same, that, that'll help with everyone's uh, viewing. Um, and I'll cut to the video now, thanks. The brown ash tree, it's a very spiritual tree. You know, it's part of our creation story. Our creation story is that Gluskab shot an arrow into the brown ash tree, and that's where the natives come singing and dancing out of the brown ash. I've made baskets for the past 35, 40 years, and brown ash has always been very important to me, to us as basket makers. I grew up as well, making baskets with my family. Brown ash in particular is culturally significant. That means a lot to me, connecting to my culture. I, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather both made baskets. My, my grandmother grew up with them in Nova Scotia and then moved to uh, Roostick County when she was really young. Made potato baskets up here and I make the joke that Richard's family was so good at making potato baskets that my family had to head south and sell fancy baskets. The kids have done some basket making projects, learned about the ash tree and how important it is, and trees and forestry in general to kind of introduce them to the idea of a career in forestry potentially. So kind of bringing along that next generation of kids to be involved in what might happen with tribal stuff in the future. The use of brown ash is integral to the indigenous basket weaving traditions of eastern Wabanoki tribes, including Holton Band of Maliseets, Penobscot Nation, Passamaquoddy Tribe, and Mi'kmaq Nation. The wood of brown ash is strong and flexible and one of a kind when it comes to separating the wood along the growth ring and within the growth ring. If you've ever taken part in processing an ash log from log form into splints used for basketry, you would know just how remarkable the properties of brown ash truly are. Some of the basket makers in Michigan actually contacted some of the basket makers in Maine about this insect killing ash trees and just to be aware and maybe we could find out more information. So that really kind of triggered some of the initial investigations, kind of put it on the radar screen and I started to work reaching out with the Maine Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, to have some meetings about this emerald ash borer and seeing about what's going on in Michigan, kind of the Great Lakes region, and, and is it coming towards our state? It, it has come across from Michigan east and, uh, and west from where it was first found. It came in on the ships and on pallets. You know, the pallets were not uh, dipped or purified and, and the emerald ash borer come in on them. And uh, they come into the shores of uh, Michigan and, and it's spread in all directions since then. But hopefully we can, uh, you know, we can create something that the tree will be able to uh, tolerate the emerald ash borer.
The Sewell, Wabanoke Weeak, Mi'kmaq, Ak, Taloisi, Tyler Everett. Greetings. I'm a person of the dawn. I'm Mi'kmaq, and my name is Tyler Everett. I'm here at the Garfield site on Mi'kmaq uh, tribal territories, checking out the ash trees as part of my research study. I'm a uh, PhD student at the University of Maine, uh, studying in Dr. John Daigle's lab, um, a Penobscot Nation tribal citizen. Uh, we're really focused on trying to preserve the ash here in the state of Maine uh, and on tribal land, Wabanoaki tribal land. Brown ash in particular is culturally significant. That means a lot to me, connecting to my culture. I, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather both made baskets. My, my grandmother grew up with them in Nova Scotia and then moved to uh, Roostick County when she was really young. Made potato baskets up here and I make the joke that Richard's family was so good at making potato baskets that my family had to head south and sell fancy baskets because they had the uh, had the hold on all the potato baskets being made. My name is Richard Sillaboy. I'm vice chief of the Mi'kmaq Nation. And we are here at the Garfield site to take a look at some of the brown ash and also do some soil samples. I've made baskets for the past 35, 40 years. And brown ash has always been very important to me, to us as basket makers. I grew up as well, making baskets with my family. We made a lot of baskets. Mother used to make 10 dozen a week, uh, large potato baskets, about like this. And uh, the boys would work on the farm and they would help make baskets at night. And just to give you an idea on how many uh, baskets was needed, in the 50s and early 60s, Aroostook County used to grow 250,000 acres of potatoes. And back then they didn't control the size, so it was easy easy to get 150 barrels per acre. That would come up to a total of 37,500,000 barrels of potatoes. And they had to be harvested within about approximately six weeks. You divide that six weeks into that 37 million, you come up with about 6,250,000 barrels uh, per week. If you take that 6,250,000, divide that by five, you're coming up with 1,250,000 barrels per day. And uh, that's, that's throughout Aroostook County. And also, the average that a person could pick in a day, some people pick 30 barrels, 40 barrels, the young people. Some people picked 100. So what I did was I averaged that out about 75 barrels per day per person. And if you divide that 75 into that uh, 1,250,000 barrels, you come up with close to 17,000 people that were harvesting potatoes. And those 17,000 people all had to have a potato basket. And that's where my family uh, played a part in, a large part. I seen mother call three taxis one day. Two taxis to haul the baskets to town and one to haul the basket makers. So we, I've always said that the Mi'kmaq people played a big role in what Aroostook County is today because they could never harvest it, that many potatoes without the help of the Native Americans. And, and it wasn't just the Mi'kmaq, it was the Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot that all came to Aroostook County. And everybody said that it was hard work and, you know, and uh, it wasn't worth it, but it was a time for all the natives to get together. And it was like a family working vacation. We played a big role in what Aroostook County is today. My name is John Daigle. I'm a professor in the School of Forest Resources at the University of Maine. I'm also a citizen member of the Penobscot Nation. My grandparents were basket makers, and I just wanted to share a story about how I got involved with the Emerald Ash Borer research at the University of Maine and working with the Wabanaki tribes. It's been nearly 12 years since I first started working on this particular project, and it really started with efforts to better understand some of the initial impacts of climate change, what we might expect to see in our forest settings. And again, here we're talking 200 years or more where we might see migrations of certain species moving northward. And one of those species I noticed early on were ash trees. It's a, it's a northern edge 
species, the brown ash, but it was, you could kind of slowly see it moving up through Maine and up into Canada. It was something that immediately concerned me having that basket history and, and still interacting with uh, Wabanaki basket makers. So I reached out to some of the tribal communities about some of the findings that I was seeing and wanted to include that in some of the reporting and help planning around kind of climate plans. But they had also heard of this emerald ash borer or insect that was killing ash trees in Michigan. Some of the basket makers in Michigan actually contacted some of the basket makers in Maine about this insect killing ash trees. And so that really kind of triggered some of the initial investigations, kind of put it on the radar screen. And I started to work reaching out with the Maine Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service to have some meetings about this emerald ash borer and seeing about what's going on in Michigan, kind of the Great Lakes region and, and is it coming toward our state. And so one of the first steps that we did was to form these meetings. We actively invited some of the uh, tribal nations from Michigan, also uh, northern New York, the Mohawk, and we had some of the initial meetings around what potential impacts could be with this emerald ash borer. And it was a real kind of collaborative coalition of people kind of meeting on a regular basis over the years. We organized trips to go to Michigan, to kind of see the effects firsthand of the emerald ash borer. So we, we had meetings in Michigan, New York, and Maine over, over these quite a few years, just kind of planning and doing things that we could do in terms of trying to maintain the health of, of the brown ash. We've always had a, a real strong effort. Again, I really credit tribal communities kind of bringing more awareness of the emerald ash borer. It got the state of Maine involved. After that first meeting that we had together, an emergency order was put in to ban the transport of firewood into the state of Maine. It was one of the first states in the country to kind of initiate that law of uh, firewood transport. And I think that is really partly one of the reasons why we still have one of the, the healthiest stands of ash in the in North America right now because of that it's it's entered our, our state of course but I think some of those early efforts really helped contribute to kind of keeping EIB out of our state. Emerald ash borer come into the nation in the late 90s and uh, it was 2002 before it was identified as a species that's uh, damaging the brown ash and this happened out in Michigan. Our group has went out there a couple three different times to take a look and see what how devastating it was out there to uh, you know on the brown ash and it, it was really devastating. We, we seen places out there that all the ash was 100% dead. They gave us the opportunity to, to peel some of the wood and study some of the larvae that, uh, you know, that's under the bark. And they taught us about the uh, adults, how far they will fly, which is anywhere from a mile to two miles per year. But they, they lay their eggs on a part of a tree where there's a piece of knot that might be messing or a weak spot in the bark and when those eggs hat they will bore inside under the bark and and they will eat the uh, the inner bark for a year sometimes two years before they come out and when they do come out of the bark they leave a hole that is d-shaped flat across the bottom and d-shaped on the top we've watched that come across from michigan and and uh, kept an eye on it and now finally it's in southern maine and and spreading pretty good in southern Maine, but also it's in northern Maine. It came across to Quebec, and there was a there's a farmer, a building that has large ash trees on both sides of the driveway, and uh, the emerald ash borer got in there, and we don't know how long it was there because there was such a, such a large supply of of feed for them, and finally it did come across the river in Madawaska area, I believe it came in first. And then it was studied and they found more of it throughout other townships. So we, we have a quarantine up there in the north that's probably six or eight, eight towns that's been under quarantine. The last thing the state did is they were going to uh, increase the size of the quarantine. And they were gonna come down as far as here down as far as Easton and Ashland, which would have been right around this area. But we argued against that and kept the quarantine. They moved it down a little bit, but 
I think Van Buren's now under a quarantine. If they're going to increase the quarantine again, I, I would suggest that we quarantine the entire county. Today, we, uh, we're losing a lot of the brown ash in, in the areas. When I was young, we never had a vehicle, and those 10 dozen baskets a week, we hauled ash you know, in the wintertime on a sled, and in the summertime, we had carried on the shoulders. Just to uh, give you an idea how plentiful the ash was back then. Today, I travel 75 miles to a place where I can harvest brown ash. And the last few times that I've harvested brown ash is right here in the Garfield area. Today, we, we wanted to look at the site, talk about the research project. There are three sites that are gonna be in Southern Maine and three sites in Northern Maine. Uh, this is one of those sites in Northern Maine. So we're closer to the emerald ash borer infestation in the northern part of the state. We can practice some reactive measures or some preemptive measures such as silviculture. We can look into insecticides and biological controls as a means of managing this site for emerald ash borer. And hopefully if all goes as planned, these trials will serve as a, a, a jumping off point toward developing a tribal brown ash management guide, giving us a, a strategy that we can employ across tribal land to address emerald ash borer in these brown ash forests. Today has been a really great site visit. We've gotten to see lots of great ash trees here at the Garfield site, check out some of the stuff that they've already been doing here, walk the edge of the, the ash stand and can potentially start looking at uh, how we might set up the study plots for this particular research project. But before we even do any management, talked a little bit earlier, these strategies, we wanna make sure that the, the community's on board with it. Hello, my name is John Scott. Uh, I'm a forester. I work for Mi'kmaq Nation. Uh, I'm a licensed forester here in Maine. I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in forest management from the University of Maine, Orono. Uh, I've worked in the private forestry sector in Maine and New Hampshire for the past 25 years. I've worked with Mi'kmaq Nation for past roughly 11 years as a consulting forester and hired on as their forestry program manager roughly six months ago. As part of the study, we also intend to coordinate community meetings where the various EAB adaptive management strategies to be employed in the study can be discussed and explored and possibly incorporated into an integrated pest management program for the tribe and others. These meetings will serve as a platform for generating dialogue among the research team, Mi'kmaq Nation Natural Resource Managers, and the Mi'kmaq community to best answer the ultimate question as to whether or not Mi'kmaq Nation feels their cultural views would or would not permit the various adaptive management strategies to occur on tribal lands as part of an integrated pest management program for EAB. So, like I said, on the front end, it, it could be silviculture. So cutting out certain ash trees that are in poor health and don't, aren't very vigorous, uh, removing them from the overstory where emerald ash borer would be called to them makes the site more resilient to emerald ash borer. It also opens up canopy gaps where we might drum up some generating brown ash trees, the next generation of ash trees that could be on this site. Leaving that really vigorous, really healthy uh, ash stand is gonna make it more resilient to emerald ash borer as it, as it nears the area. Then we could come in and do some, some other adaptive management strategies uh, such as seed collection. Hi, my name is Emily Francis and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Maine working with Dr. John Daigle and Tyler Everett. A big interest is in actually collecting ash seed. There are a number of different reasons for collecting ash seed. And there's for propagation, for long-term storage, short-term storage for eventual genetic studies, along with other types of research that have to do with trees. And it is something that happens all across the country. There's other seed collection projects, but not so much in Maine. So what we're really interested in and what there has been a call from the tribal communities, the basket artisans and harvesters has been a really a guidance or interest in how to collect seed and prepare for storage. If we can find the female ash trees on a good seed year, we can collect that seed. Um, we can do a couple different things with that seed. We could put it into long-term storage, put it in a federal facility in, in a deep freeze, or we could store it local with our community, just in a regular walk-in freezer. That'll stay viable for 
uh, many years. We could replant after emerald ash borers come through the area, ash trees that are native to this area, which is really in alignment with the management that we want to see here at Mi'kmaq Nation. The portion of the project that I'm working on is coming in and developing a seed collection protocol, which is really focused on the, the non-researcher, the basket maker, the harvester, citizen scientist, and you know, private landowner who's really interested in collecting and protecting seed for ash. And with the three types of ash that we have in Maine, we're really looking for the wild ash, not necessarily the green or the white ash that people have planted that are nursery stock. We're really looking for the ash that's wild on people's property. And of course, for the, the brown ash, we're really looking at you know, trees that are basket quality. We, we're interested in that genetic material for research in the future. When I'm out looking for basket wood, I'll try not take anything or under six, seven inches, you know, because that gives that a chance to grow. But what I'm looking for is a tree that you can tell but tree is straight and you start by looking at the, uh, the bottom of the tree and see how straight it is and what the bark looks like. And then you observe the crown of the tree and see if there's any dieback on the crown or you know how healthy that looked up on the top. So that'll give you a good idea on what, what the tree is going to be like when you process it. What I'm looking for is probably a piece that's uh, straight. You can tell that through the bark and, and also uh, something that's free of knots, free of limbs. You can tell quality of the tree by the soil that it's uh, growing in. A lot of times it's it will grow in, in little swales like among some alders and uh, along the rivers. You know, on the bend of a river, there's usually a, a flood plain that will have good soil uh, for good growth on basketwood. One part of what we've done is contacted and worked very closely with some um, of the tribes in New York, specifically uh, with Les Benedict to the St. Regis Mohawk in the Aquasafne, who has been doing ash seed collection for many years, even before EAB was an issue. And working with them to really figure out what's the best protocol and how we can make this accessible to people who are, who are interested as community members and not researchers. So the outcome of what I'm working on is a is a document that people will be able to use to collect seed on their own. And we're very excited what the future of that document will be. We're looking at it as a living document so that can be updated over time, regardless of who is still involved in the future with um, our specific research team. We're hoping to have that document, the, the plan is to have that ready this fall to do some trials of it and get it ready for a publication or a rolling out sometime this winter. We also might make some seedling stock. So during the active management of this site, we could do some underplanting in the silviculture. And then beyond silviculture, uh, in seed collection, there's a bit more reactive measures. So once emerald ash borer is established at the site, there's uh, two techniques that uh, we could integrate into our approach here at these sites, which is pesticides or uh, chemical treatments of select ash trees. Particularly, it would be those that are seed bearing. So the mature uh, overstory trees that are female and would produce seed, we, we could inject those with a systemic insecticide. That insecticide would, would kill emerald ash borer in there. If we employ it early on, we might be able to get three or four more seed years out of that tree and provide a, a new regenerating layer of ash trees each time before it succumbs to emerald ash borer. That's what buys us time. And it, that's what it's all about. All these approaches buy us time to make sure we can keep ash on the landscape, this culturally important, economically and ecologically important species. Buying time for things like the biological controls. And so that's the other reactive measure we could employ here. Uh, we could do some releases of these parasitoid wasps that are native to Southeast Asia, release them here uh, as, as natural enemies to emerald ash borer. If they become established, they might keep emerald ash borer populations low enough that we can see an interaction between emerald ash borer, these parasitoid wasps, and the ash trees here on site where everything coexists and everything is in a, in a balance so that we can keep ash on the landscape. Emerald ash borer does not just go through and decimate ash stands. Instead, the interaction is sustained. And that's really what we're hoping to accomplish 
And so it really is all about buying time. If we can buy time to, to see that come to fruition, maybe we can protect this culturally important tree. Yeah, it's gonna be good to uh, start, start monitoring right now for emerald ash borer that way. You know, although it, it doesn't make sense that it would be here, you never know. And the earlier you know that emerald ash borer is here, the better we can time up Especially some of the management. Yep, yeah. And it, where there's already been basil bark sprays, I'm sure yeah. if we wanted to explore injections, yeah. it'd be cool to, to, uh, to explore that and talk about it. We'll get a setup anyway, because we want to do it at some of the other sites too. Yeah. And then uh, if you guys get needles as well, it just makes it faster to inject more trees. Mm -hmm. But what's unknown is how many trees in a stand, like trees per acre, treated, mm -hmm. should you have to protect the stand. And that's hopefully something we could figure out, toy around with, get an idea as to how many trees we should be injecting. Another thing that we thought about too is if, if we do a harvest and take out some trees, you're going to get stump sprouts. Yeah. If you inject that stump, does, are all the sprouts going to have oh, right. the insecticide as a protectant? Because yeah. they'll, they'll infest trees down to an inch. Right, right. And so it's, you know, anything you can do to make it a little bit more um, protected, the better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, plus the spacing, because uh, the, the trees that are injected mm -hmm. actually has an effect where it actually protects some of the surrounding Mm -hmm. the immediate surrounding trees. So it's interesting, the, a recent study found that, so after emerald ash borer gets to the tree, the larvae are inside, if you inject it, you get quite a few that die, the larvae as they're feeding on the bark. Huh. Um, but really when you get the mortality is when they pupate and emerge as adults, they have to feed on foliage for about two weeks. And so in that two week period, they'll eat the leaves and those have high concentrations of the insecticide. I see. And so that's where they get the most kill mm -hmm. on adults, which is important because that's right before they lay their eggs. Right. Well, this will be a first step to see, you know, at least to detect, uh, see if there's any migration of the, of the pest down this way. We need to continue to teach our young teach our elders to continue to participate in basket making. We also need to do an apprentice for younger people to get them interested into the art of basket making. Dr. Dina Winslow, I'm the tribal planner and grant writer for the Mi'kmaq Nation. Been there nine years now, but I've been involved with the tribe since I was just very young. So been familiar with all the things that have been happening over the years. One of the projects that we're here to kind of talk about a little bit today is in 2015, I kind of came up with an idea for a grant and wrote the grant pertaining to getting the tribal youth involved what's, because we knew the ash borer was coming our way. So Richard and John Scott, our forester, both helped out with tremendously with working with the youth and we did some pretty exciting things for kids. John and I were talking about this yesterday. The, we took the kids to a site where they were cutting lumber in the woods a contractor and those kids loved it. They said they had no idea that people actually cut down trees or that they did something with these trees, you know, like, so that was really a lot of fun to see their reaction to that and enjoy that part of it. And we also took them to visit some forestry sites at some of the big land companies and a museum. We did quite a lot of work with them. We talked about the ash borer. I did a project with them one at one point where I had the kids drawing pictures of the ash borer for posters and making posters about why that why the bug was dangerous and what was going to happen with it. That was quite a lot of fun. John came and talked to them at one point too and, and they've made baskets as well. The kids have done some basket making projects, learned about the ash tree and how important it is and trees and forestry in general to kind of introduce them to the idea of a career in forestry potentially at some future time. So kind of bringing along that next generation of kids to be involved in what might happen with tribal stuff in the future. We went up along a, a, an area where there were some ash trees and got all the kids down in the ditch. Remember, we had quite a job getting them down in the ditch and over across to these trees. And John Scott was with us and this tree had seeds on it. So we didn't really have any proper equipment to capture the seeds. We laid out the tarp, John shook the tree and the wind, just at that moment, a big gust of wind came up, 
And all of those seeds went right out over all of us and landed behind everybody. And the kids were just looking like, what just happened? <laughs> it was pretty funny. We've planted seeds. We grew some ash seedlings. There was a story in the newspaper about this project that we were working with the kids on. And a tree grower down in southern Maine was at the garage having his car fixed. And he read the article in the paper as he's waiting for his car. And he looked online, he found my home phone number, and just as I was going home for lunch, my phone rang, and this guy called, and he said, he's a tree grower for FedEx, and he grew ash trees, and he'd like to donate some ash trees to our project. We went down and got the ash. Richard went with me. We went down and got, talked to the guy and saw what he had, and we got these trees, and we planted what the kids call the circle of trees at Spruce Haven, which is a tribal facility where people gather a lot for the powwow and Mauiomi, other various events. So we had these, this lovely circle of trees that opens to the east, and we put a nice park bench in there, and the kids came out and had a nice ceremony to welcome the trees there. It was really quite nice, and the tribal community came out. We had some songs and prayers and things for those trees, so they're doing pretty well over there. We still have 13 trees, which represented the 13 moons for the tribes. That was one of the things we did with the kids that was quite a lot of fun and they loved it because it's their trees, it's for their future, they'll know that they did that, that was their project. Uh, basket making is the oldest art in the Northeast uh, before brown ash baskets was the birch bark, which that would be the oldest art in the, in the Northeast. Hopefully, uh, you know, that we can continue to teach our people and continue to do apprenticeship work. All right, <clears throat> so I uh, just want to give John Daigle, Emily Francis, John Scott, Vice Chief Richard Silliboy, Dina Winslow, a thank you for contributing to that film, and then Nolan Altivator uh, for doing the filming. Uh, that really came out awesome. I'm, I hope everyone else enjoyed it. Um, I know we're, uh, we're over on time, so I'm going to not waste too much time, I wanna pass it along to uh, Professor John Daigle, uh, my academic advisor, and uh, also featured in the film. And uh, he's gonna do a presentation on uh, the climate change considerations for brown ash um, preservation in the long term. So the floor is yours, John. You should be a co-host, you should be able to share right away. John, while you're um, getting set up, uh, I was just really amazed by, I was doing the math right along with Vice Chief Richard Silliboy, you know, <laughs> and just the quantity of that. It's just 17,000 baskets, you know, um, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine, but um, yeah, I think uh, that was just, that was just amazing. Um, uh, that one of the takeaways I had from it. Uh, John, it looks like you're up, so I'm gonna go ahead and mute my microphone. Great. Uh, yeah, I just want to show a few more of the fancy baskets, um, uh, other baskets that were made. And 
like I mentioned in the video, my grandparents were actual basket makers too. They're they're more utility baskets. My grandparents made pack baskets and um, and other types of baskets, you know, compared to these small little fancy baskets. But again, the basket making was really important to the family for income, um, time to be together, share stories and stuff. So really important. Um, I wanted to also show um, some of the early research, kind of looking at some of the impacts of climate change and projections of things that we might see. Um, and this, fo this focuses around, the, and again, there's a whole list of different tree species. There's maple trees and other kind of things that we can kind of look at the projected changes in habitat suitability for species. But <clears throat> You can see there's a, a rough boundary, but you can the, the black ash or brown ash is kind of a northern edge species for you know for America. It's really prevalent in uh, Minnesota, um, Wisconsin. Green is a, is a heavier heavier population where there's actually kind of full stands of, of black ash, whereas compared to Maine, um, it's throughout our state, but <clears throat> it's not a dominant tree species. It's, it's really 4% of our forest. Um, but again, it's everywhere in, in, our, in our state and uh, important, important tree species, very important tree species. So, you, you know, I don't know if you quite make out the color here, but the green is, is more prevalence. Yellow is, again, where there's black ash. And if you look into the future, you're losing that heavy dose of green to just yellow in this region. And the yellow is kind of just starting here. So essentially what's happening is, you know, as, as the climate is warming, it's becoming less suitable, you know, for black ash and it's moving up north, up into Canada. And, um, you know, which is, which is concerning, you know, and, um, you know, but this is, we're talking hundreds of years probably for this to occur in terms of maybe loss of species. Um, <clears throat> and as you saw in the video um, and hearing from some of the basket makers, the emerald ash borer really took precedence, you know, when I shared this information with them. <laughs> with them. Um, but what I wanted to do today was just talk about kind of the confluence of both of these things, climate change and also the emerald ash borer, because I think these are, these are, these are things that we kind of need to think together in some way. Uh, particularly as we think about some of the management strategies and, um, and just thinking about how we're going to be, you know, thinking through our strategies with the emerald ash borer. And um, I wanted to share this. This is a, a very young picture of Richard Silliboy here. <laughs> um, but again, uh, you know, he, Again, like uh, Les Benedict, I mean, you know, you, we have individuals who have had such a vested interest in the brown ash. It's such such a cultural it's such a cultural keystone species. Um, you know, he's he, Richard has always been concerned about the health even before the emerald ash borer, and basically, this work that was done in the um, late '80s, early '90s, focused around brown ash health, and it was the the declining health of brown ash where it was affecting the trees to a level where it made it not suitable for basket making. When they pounded the ash tree and tried to split it into you know, splints, it would just splinter. So I, I guess I'd just like to have us think through not only just maybe climate change and maybe the habitat suitability, but also the effects that we might see with a changing climate, whether it's through drought or through rain events that might put more stressors on brown ash, as well as other trees. But I, I think that is something that we need to think about. Um, because I, again, I think if there's a little bit more stress put on those trees, it might even be more susceptible to the emerald ash borer. Um, but the other thing too is, you know, in this work, you know, there, there are individuals who are so committed to trying to find ways to, you know, sustain ash and, 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 and work on ash preservation efforts. Okay. 
if I can get rid of the, I don't know if my top screen is showing on that. Um, and the other thing I'd like to have us think about as we think about the emerald ash borer and trees being killed by the emerald ash borer, you know, um, where in some cases like in Michigan, you know, some people are, have no longer access or, or have access close by for trees to make baskets. And they've had to make a tough decision to stop the practice. And so how do, how do we think through ways of sustaining that cultural practice? Because it really, you know, as Robin, Robin Kimmerer notes here, it's the doing, right? It's the doing of the basket making, the tree harvesting, the processing that really works to instill meanings, reflect our cultural values. Um, our connections to the plants and our identity. So I think that's something really, really central that we kind of need to think about um, as we, as we kind of move forward. This is a picture of Les Benedict, um, who we've been working with from the very beginning. And again, he's another person that was involved in ash preservation efforts in terms of seed collection, and even before EAB arrival, um, in terms of trying to sustain um, ash on the landscape, re repopulate land, the landscape with ash trees. And um, one of the quotes that I really like that he's talked about several times is that, you know, through all the sadness that EAB, you know, may have caused, you know, it really, in a weird sense, it really has kind of been a mechanism for reestablishing tribe to tribe relationships where you know, um, we've really been working close together, sharing, sharing information, visiting each other's lands. And, um, and so um, it's, it's kind of been a mechanism for coalition that I think is important. So, oops. Um, I'm just going to go through, you know, again, you know, focus on, you know, thinking through kind of the climate effects, but with also recognizing the effects of the emerald ash borer, um, I really do feel that um, it's gonna take a, a coalition and cooperation from a variety of different entities to be involved. And, um, and I'm gonna just talk about, about a few of those entities. You saw you know, this picture here, down here with our trip to Michigan. Um, to, to look at and observe some of the effects of EAB early on as part of our project efforts. But again, um, this is the first year we had the fire wood ban in Maine where they actually had a vehicle at the entrance station to where they were given a free exchange for firewood with their new policy if someone was bringing firewood with them. And uh, they didn't long to do that, but again, it was kind of a good faith effort to try to get compliance. And again, meetings with Michigan and some of the tribes in Michigan, really, really important. Again, looking at the effects, looking at kind of the long-term implications. And again, I think that might be helpful as we think about examining the effects of climate change where we might look at certain regions of our country that may have maybe showing more signs of the impact of climate change in terms of the distribution of ash, particularly the Southern edge. Um, I think would be helpful uh, just as kind of our strategy where we, what we went to right to the zone, we went to Michigan and started in looking at that area where it was the, you know, uh, the red zone and kind of look at, look at that and, and its effect going across uh, the East uh, New York and then here in Maine. So meetings in Michigan, New York, and again, sharing just valuable information. You know, this is Les and uh, his report on developing a community response plan, a propagation manual for black ash. Nothing really existed, you know, with, you know, to, with his work with the black ash. So just a, just a wealth, wealth of knowledge. And of course we had some meetings here in Maine and um, a, clo a colloquium here in Maine and, and later in Vermont where we had tribal involvement and also federal and state efforts in terms of um, research and management efforts around, around black ash, which have been very valuable. 
And increasingly we've been um, working more on outreach. It always has been part of the outreach, particularly around the transport of firewood to try to, you know, like Tyler talked about, give us more time uh, for research and other efforts around the emerald ash borer. And we've been working with private landowners. Um, and again, now that EAB is in our state has actually generated a real push, you know, in people wanting to learn more about the emerald ash borer, the effects it might have on their forests, including ash. And I'm very pleased in terms of some of the um, concern um, a lot of private landowners have on the Wabanaki cultural lifeways, you know, of the ash and what they might be able to do to help support efforts in ash preservation. And this is a picture of, of Les, myself, and Emily, and some of the tribal members going on this property here on the Nature Conservancy, looking at some of their ash trees. So I, I know Tony's going to get into this a little bit more and some of the integrated pest management strategies, but I thought I'd just cover very briefly a couple key strategies that I think is important as we think about some of the climate effects, um, climate adaptation, uh, and especially with the emerald ash borer. Um, you know, seed collection and seed banking is going to be something that is really, really important. Um, we know unfortunately that black or brown ash is the most susceptible species of ash. Uh, all, all native ash species are susceptible to EAB, but black is especially where we have 95% uh, mortality when the animal ash borer um, comes through an area and impacts black ash. So there's really a limited amount of time. If you want to collect seed, um, we need to do it sooner than later. And so some of the seed collection effort, um, I think, needs to start happening very soon here in our state. And in particular for seed collecting on a geographic area where we wanna to try to have geographic zones, right? So we wanna have seed collected in different parts of our state. We have actually three eco, eco zones here in Maine, eco type zones that go from south to north. And um, so we really wanna collect ash that is representative of the full state and also seed that are collected from basket quality trees and locations is, is a real high priority. And, and less in, um, uh, in uh, Richard here and their efforts uh, sharing knowledge was very helpful. And this is something that we'll be doing in the near future. And the idea here is that through that seed collection, the hope is that through possible genetics research, um, development of more resistant ash, some of those seeds could be replanted, propagated, um, and, and replanted in those same locations where the seed was collected. And the possibility of replanting resistant ash trees. And I think there's some hope here because uh, there has been some signs of effectiveness in the development of resistant ash trees, particularly with the white and the green ash trees, where uh, it takes time, but the resistant ash have been replanted in EAB still infested areas and they've been able to survive. So I do hope, I do think there is potential hope for, for the black and brown ash. The other work, you know, related to this is, you know, some of the work that Tyler has been involved in with his master's work in developing an ash uh, manual, ash collection uh, uh, inventory manual, because one of the things that we need um, is to identify where our ash trees are, ID those ash trees that are potential mother trees, uh, seed producers, and for monitoring the inventory and monitoring our, of our ash is very critical. And uh, so there's been efforts to do work on sharing that information. Uh, Tyler gave a workshop for trying some of the tribal foresters uh, a, a, winter so, a winter or so ago um, at a site at the University Forest um, on some of the ash manual techniques. And it's not just uh, inventory of ash, it's, the, it's inventory of a lot of other different elements that Tony's gonna to get into in terms of if you want to integrate um, 
pesticide treatment or insecticides, you need more than just where the tree is growing. You kind of need to know how many trees you have in that region and soil and how close to water and all these other things that um, that's part of um, Tyler's manual to kind of be able to implement some of the integrated pest management strategies. And again, monitoring is, is really key for uh, timing is, is really important for, for implementation of the strategies. And so this is an effort for having some of the trap trees and checking those trees for emerald ash borer. It's Richard scraping the tree to look for emerald ash borer. The state of Maine Forest Service has been really key from the beginning, um, have been real strong partners with, um, with the tribe. Um, and uh, they've been involved with most of our, our workshops and, and outreach efforts. So we're going to continue to do more work with the with the land with landowners. Um, again, as we think about seed collection efforts on a large landscape level, I think that's important. So we're not. I mean, we're going to be collecting seed on tribal forest lands, but I think we need to be thinking about a larger scale effort in, in seed collection efforts. And I think one of the real values of of getting more involvement with other landowners here in our state is. Uh, maybe their willingness to consider some of the management strategies that Tony's gonna to talk about, because in some cases it may require, uh, you know, not harvesting all their ash when EAB is approaching, right? So the idea if you harvest all your ash, that takes out the possibility for identifying any resistant ash to EAB um, or the possibility for seed production. And so, um, so, the involvement of landowners, um, possibility for access as, as black ash becomes more scarce, will they provide access to, to get to you know, brown ash on their property? Again, we're, we're seeing a lot of cooperation as well as seed collection from many, many landowners in Maine, which is really, really um, promising, I think. And uh, just a couple more slides here, but again, uh, um, you know, as we think about some of the ash preservation efforts, there really is kind of a growing community and um, development of strategies. Time, more time is better, better, but again, we're making, we seem to be making some good progress where it was so um, bleak, I should say, you know, 10 years ago, it was, it was very bleak because at that point we knew that 95% of all black ash was killed when the EAB was coming through. But again, we're kind of developing strategies and now we even have come up with this concept of ash preservation. And that wasn't even a concept um, 10 years ago. And developing strategies around ash preservation, I think is really, really promising. And we seem to be getting some buy-in from, from people who wanna take action to help do that. And uh, I, there's more pe more entities involved, but I just want to, you know, acknowledge some of the entities that that have been involved in this work, with the APHIS, U.S. Forest Service, Tony with the University of Vermont Forest Guild. Um, we're kind of a core team that um, that's working together, and we're adding to our team um, for those that are interested in, in ash preservation management. So we certainly would welcome other folks to becoming part of part of our group. And this is a slide at one of the ash conferences I attended. I took a picture of someone's presentation <laughs> and they had a, this slide that I thought was pretty cool. So Billy Wong, thank you very much. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Dr. John Daigle. That was an excellent presentation. Hit on some really important aspects of uh, ash ash preservation and some um, great pictures all throughout. It's pretty pretty amazing the uh, community of people that have come together to, to do work on ash. Um, I'd like to open it up for uh, some questions from the group. If, if anyone has a question for, for John, I think we have time for one question before we move on. <clears throat> uh, but keep in mind, we will do a, a panel discussion after the next presentation. So if you're still thinking through your question, you'll have an opportunity uh, before we close out today to ask the whole group of presenters.
um, questions. Just check the chat here. Okay. All righty. Well, now I will pass it along to Dr. Tony D'Amato, uh, professor uh, at the University of Vermont and director of the forestry program at the University of Vermont. Um, very well known researcher in the space of brown ash or black ash. Uh, and I'm really excited to hear uh, his presentation on integrated pest management for emerald ash borer and ash preservation. So go ahead, Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler, and thanks people for logging in. And, and also thanks, uh, John and, and Tyler and others for the great presentations and recording before me. Um, really what I'll be doing is, is building upon uh, many different ideas that have already been, been shared uh, today and have been shared by, by many uh, before me just around both the importance of, of ash and, and how we think about the threat that emerald ash borer poses to it, but, but more broadly thinking about emerald ash borer is just one of unfortunately many threats that are either currently affecting our forests or gonna affect our forests in the future. And so, as John mentioned, um, I've really been fortunate to partner with, with many people, including Tyler and, and John and Les, to think a bit more broadly about um, what is our role in, in thinking a bit more actively about preserving species in the face of these threats and, and how do we actually both internalize that with our values, but also think through on the ground what that might look like and, and what may not may or may not be feasible. And so I'll start just by talking broadly about independent of species, why we might think about um, preservation, um, and then I'll get into some of those strategies with, with some details um, building upon what Tyler talked about in the video, as well as what John talked about in this presentation in terms of how we go about, about doing that. But certainly I'm speaking um, from the wisdom of many um, that, that I've been able to learn from over this, over this uh, journey with emerald ash borer. So just to kind of bring that point home, I, I think when we talk about preserving a tree species and in particular preserving mature trees um, in the face of an insect or disease, often we really think that the only applications are like in somebody's front yard or in a boulevard. And, and if you look at urban tree care and in residential tree care, there's a lot of effort that actually goes into um, trying to preserve trees um, in the face of these threats. And, and I would confess that even a few years ago, I would be of the camp to say that really that's where it makes the most sense. You know, really, really it's, it's not feasible at large scales in rural settings. Um, so why should we even try? And, and what I've learned over time, just both in terms of the cultural importance, but also the ecological importance of ash is that um, the tools and, and our knowledge and really the magnitude of impact is, is, is getting so great at this point that um, maybe there are scenarios where we should be thinking more um, seriously about kind of widespread preservation of species um, while we still, still have the opportunity. So what I'm going to be talking about is kind of a general framework that um, myself and, and the others that are on that title slide have been thinking through both in terms of um, how we might approach preservation of a, of a species in the face of, of non-native insects and diseases, and then dig in a bit more into specific strategies as it relates to, to ash and preservation of ash. Um, and, and in particular, I'm thinking about brown and black ash. So when we're thinking about preserving a species, really what's going to influence um, why and, and how revolves a lot around our values that we're trying to preserve. And so specifically, what are our preservation values? You know, why do we want to preserve that species as a mature tree um, or potentially as seed or potentially as some derived material for the future? And so using those values really as a guide to how we might actually approach that uh, on the landscape. And so if we're trying to actually maintain some sort of function on the landscape that, that living large trees provide, what our key approach would be that we need to find ways to keep those trees alive and use those strategies like integrated pest management that allows us to do that. And so what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is talk a little bit first about four kind of key preservation values that might guide um, why we actually are doing species preservation on the landscape, and then kind of finish up with some of the technical details around how people are approaching um, using different strategies for preserving ash within places like Maine and elsewhere. So we recognize uh, with this work kind of four key preservation values that really are interrelated, but that's certainly been talked about even throughout the presentations today and in the video, and that there are kind of four main arenas where we might be thinking through why it's actually worth possibly the investment of both you know, people time as well as resources into preserving species. 
And those four values, again, that are related to one another are ethical responsibility, cultural integrity, ecological function, and genetic conservation. And so these being kind of key values that are guiding us and motivating us to want to preserve a species. And so I'll start with kind of the ethical responsibility. And for time in memoriam, really, we've had this relationship with the natural world that there's a responsibility to maintain the relationship among beings. And from our perspective, this is fulfilled by honoring the gifts we offer one another as beings within the natural world. And so before non-native invasive insects and diseases, this was a relationship that was held among, among individuals across the landscape. Unfortunately, what this graph is showing on the right is that humans um, have really increased the number of non-native insects. This is the number of wood borers that have, that have accumulated over time. This is the number of insect pests that have accumulated over time. And so beyond this, this basic ethical responsibility, we now have a new ethical obligation to conserve these species that are facing threats that we have brought upon them. And so thinking through, you know, as we try to maintain these species in the landscape, there is this ethical obligation to do that. Likewise, um, as has been touched upon many times um, today and that, that all of you appreciate, there's also unique cultural values tied to species. And certainly these photos here are both a small grove of ash as well as splints coming from a black ash and as well as the baskets derived um, from black ash, including some of those nice potato baskets um, that Richard um, creates. But this could be talked about for many species, whether it's the, the value of white oak or chestnut or elm or white bark pine. Each species has these key cultural values. And so maintaining those in, either in the form of living individuals in the landscape or maintaining the materials that we derive from those species warrants thinking through why in motivating our preservation. And certainly a lot of that has been talked about today already. Likewise, besides those unique cultural values, um, tree species have unique ecological functions. And these pictures here really relate to the functions that ash provides, but I could have similar pictures again for longleaf pine or for white pine or for red oak or for Douglas fir. Every tree species has a unique chemical composition of its foliage, has unique growth patterns, creates unique environments. And so when we lose those species from the landscape, we also lose the ecological functions they provide. And so an additional motivating value for why we might want to preserve a species is that we're trying to preserve the functions they provide. So in the case of lowland um, ash forests, it's often trying to preserve that hydrologic regulation that ash might provide. Similarly, the leaf litter from all ash species is quite nutrient rich. And so tadpoles and caddisflies and other organisms actually eating that foliage tend to have higher rates of fecundity and so tend to do much better in those environments. And so losing that species, we lose some of those functions. And as a result, we are motivated potentially um, by the desire to keep that function on a site. And then finally, um, as Emily touched upon and, and others have, have discussed, there is this long-term desire that we ultimately can preserve some genetic strains of the species that show resistance. And so if we lose all the species from a landscape, either through preemptive cutting um, or other stressors, we might no longer have the opportunity to actually come up with new individuals to plant out there in the landscape, as John was talking about, that might actually have future resistance and give kind of the opportunity to have that relationship with that species over time, both as a living organism in the forest, as well as potentially from the derived materials we gain from that. And so the, the last value is really this preservation of that genetic information out there in the landscape. So what I'm going to get into is specific to ash. And again, many of these strategies do apply to other insects and diseases, but I'll just talk through briefly, and again, it built upon um, what already has been, I think, explained in much better format in that video um, by Tyler and others, how we might think about approaching um, preservation and how it's already occurring, uh, both um, in kind of urban settings, but also now being applied to more rural settings to, to maintain and preserve ash on a landscape. And so the first type of approach we might take, and, and Tyler mentioned this and had great examples of this within the video, is that if we want to have future generations of ash in the forest, sometimes there's often the thought that if these trees are threatened by emerald ash borer, the logical action is to go out there and just cut all those trees and not think through kind of how that might influence future generations. And so what we've really been trying to in inform people about more broadly is that both the loss of individual ash trees by emerald ash borer, as well as kind of the haphazard harvesting that often occurs when people are motivated by salvaging trees, might not be as effective in recruiting new generations of ash. And so as, as Tyler mentioned in, in the presentation, creating that light environment necessary to recruit new cohorts of, of brown ash and black ash. And this, these pictures here, I'm actually showing white ash, which, which is really light demanding. And so oftentimes besides using selection um, harvest methods, you might need even larger opening sizes that create 
the light environments necessary to actually recruit new cohorts of ash in the landscape to future generations. At the same time, um, as, as John pointed out, there is some hope um, that some ash are resistant. And the only way we really can learn if they are resistant is by leaving some behind. And so a lot of what we often talk about is not only recruiting um, new ash in the landscape, but where possible leaving some mature ash behind, preferably female ash, um, as future seed sources, as well as future tests of resistance to give us opportunities for selecting individuals for future genetic breeding and so forth. Nevertheless, when people talk about preservation, most of the emphasis is around using insecticides um, in the context of our ash borer um, to protect ash. And so oftentimes when we're in urban residential setting, the, the range of, of insecticides that might be appropriate are a bit different than what might be appropriate in a forest where we're really concerned about what the impacts might be on other, other biota and other organisms. And so because of that, really the main type of insecticide we think of and what's being used at broad scales for preserving ash are those that are directly injected into the trunk. And as a result, there's less risk of impact on other organisms and other plants. The other reason why people are looking at uh, trunk in injections, particularly emamectin and benzoate, is that it actually lasts for three years. And so there's not this need for repeated um, treatment over time. And so the cost, even though it's not cheap, um, is, is every three years. So roughly $5 to $10 per inch as opposed to a, year, a yearly application. I'll talk a bit more about other controls of, of EAB in a moment, but, but, but none of them other than insecticides are really effective at treating very large trees. And so if you, if you have a very large ash trees, insecticides can be effective all the way up to a 60 inch tree. Those not interested in chemicals, there is an organic alternative um, basically derived from neem oil um, that, that tends to be um, less effective when there's actually a large outbreak and also requires annual application. So although this may work at low levels of EAB densities, um, it's, still, it's still suggestive that the emamectin benzoate is a much, much better approach to this. So if you're going to do chemical treatment, and again, Tyler talked about this a bit in that presentation, what, when do you actually think about doing this if you're trying to preserve that species in the landscape? And timing is critical. And there's two kind of aspects of the timing. The first is that you don't want to be both wasting money as well as putting chemicals into the environment when you don't have to. And so I'll talk about this a little bit more a little bit later, but those monitoring efforts that actually give you a sense for where EAB is in the landscape. And again, um, those funnel traps that, that Tyler, they were talking about hanging, hanging out in the woods during that video um, really are critical to know is EAB either in the landscape or close to where I am? Because that's the timing of when you really want to start preserving tree species with these approaches. That way those trees already have insecticide um, as EAB is approaching, but also you're not wasting it on trees that are far away from an outbreak. The other piece, and again, you know, Tyler and I really should have coordinated this. Like it's good to reinforce. Like, we did. Well, you'd think we coordinated this, um, as he was mentioning. Um, you want to um, have impact on both the larvae and, and more importantly, on the adults that feed on the leaves. And so, um, as that insecticide is going through the stem, um, it's basically being translocated into the leaves, and, and that's that's where you have a high level of of impact. Um, on the emerald ash borer as it's feeding on the leaves. And so late spring application tends to be um, when that's most, most effective. This, this picture in the middle here is just from some work that Purdue's been doing. On, you can actually go online and see how much it would cost to treat trees. And it's just comparing for, for 12 saw timber sized trees. If I were to remove those, this is kind of the cost over, over time with 3% discount rate. So just harvesting them as opposed to preserving those with, with, with treatments. And so every three years, I'm retreating those trees. And so again, it's not a trivial amount of money, but you'll notice that the, the timing gets, gets wider over time with the assumption being that emerald ash borer populations kind of start to crash um, with, with that level of treatment um, as, you, as, as time progresses, but still it requires quite a bit of funding to, for this to occur. The other piece is that you can't treat an entire forest. And, and I think you know, part of why initially when we talked about preserving species, many often said, well, you can only do that on one tree in someone's yard or, or, or on maybe a boulevard in, in an urban setting is, is the scale question. But nevertheless, you know, there still are opportunities to do this by prioritizing individual trees within a stand um, for, for preservation. So the first filter really revolves around, you know, are those trees actually vigorous enough to once treated actually withstand the AB infestation? And generally what the work has been showing with chemical approaches is that trees with greater 50% crown dieback really um, aren't able to respond um, favorably to those insecticide treatments and withstand the AB um, impact over time. And so choosing those vigorous individuals, that makes sense within the population. 
likewise, the key filter beyond the vigor is what are the preservation values? And so the trees that you select really are gonna be driven by what your values are um, for preservation. So if, if the lens is cultural, you're choosing those trees that really are providing, in, in the case of EAB, um, material that's most suitable for baskets. I mean, for other threatened tree species, it could be other, other forms of tree that might be most suitable for, for the materials that are important or culturally significant. But in the case of, of, of black ash, really those, those individuals that have the, the stem forms um, that, that are desirable. If your goal is functional, so trying to maintain an ecological function, it might be those, those individuals that might not be preserved by other approaches. So those large trees that can't be sustained um, by biocontrols. And then genetic, again, um, looking at those individuals that can actually produce seed um, that might show some signs of resistance. And in the case of some of the work that's happening right now in New Hampshire, they're really favoring females by a ratio of about three to one. Um, so, so preserving you know, the reproductively capable individuals across that, that region. The other piece, and I'll focus just on, on lowlands, um, it really depends on the site. Um, Tyler's done a lot of work on this, and we've certainly looked at this quite a bit, particularly in the lake states. But black ash exists from kind of uplands to riparian zones to large basinal wetlands. And so depending on where it exists, its influence on water table dynamics is, varies quite a bit. And so on, on one end of the spectrum, you have these large basins and lowlands. As um, so you can see, um, here's an existing black ash stand, and here's an area where the black ash all died. And so on these areas, black ash has a very important role um, in, in kind of regulating hydrology. And so when the black ash dies, there's a real risk of that site swamping out and shifting to non-forested conditions. And so from some work looking at civil cultural trials, what they've shown is once you get beyond 60% um, loss of overstory, you really do have a, a, a bump in the water table that floods the site. And so if you're trying to maintain that, that hydrologic functioning, protecting 40% of the dominant and co-dominant individuals might be necessary. Similarly, if it's a site where you're trying to maintain those cultural values and, it, and it's going to shift to a non-ash forest, it might be a very similar level of protection. Um, and, and likewise with, with the genetic. If you're in a black ash or brown ash community where there's not that risk of swamping, generally what State of New Hampshire and others have been doing is about 10 to 12 trees per site that they're protecting um, with, with insecticides and doing it in a way that having groups of protected trees actually kind of gets a, a broader benefit to trees that aren't protected but are also surrounded by them. And so there are some strategies for just protecting groups of trees um, in isolated locations within sites. In terms of non-chemical controls, as many of you are aware of, um, with any introduced insect or disease, there's, there's a real push to also find biological controls um, that can be introduced as a way to be um, kind of you know, controls on those populations, often collecting um, native predators of those species from, um, from within their range. So in the case of, of EAB going over to China and finding organisms that have um, been parasitoids over there. The issue with, with parasitoids is that from a timing perspective, emerald ash borer has to be present. You need to have the food there present for the biocontrol. And this map on the right is just showing a biocontrol release sites in the Northeast. And those that know where EAB is in the Northeast will know that those release sites are exactly where EAB is in the Northeast. And so it needs to be um, where EAB is present. But there are three parasitoids um, that are being viewed as one way to preserve EAB potentially, uh, Tetrasticus, Spathius, and Ubius. Um, one of these, Ubius, um, really has at this point been, been removed as, as being effective. It's just not a high level of parasitism. But the other two um, larval parasitoids are still viewed as, as, as effective for trying to um, contain uh, EAB populations over time. What's important is that um, the, there are limitations to these biocontrols beyond potential um, you know, concerns people have about introducing other species to the landscape. The size of the ash that actually can be protected um, it really varies depending on um, the physiology and anatomy of the, the, the biocontrol that are being released. Release. And so Tetrasticus actually doesn't have an ovipositor that's long enough um, to get into um, uh, like large diameter ash. And here's a picture of it for scale um, next to Spathius, which is a lot larger. And so this, this organism is actually able to penetrate um, into larger diameter trees and, and predate on, on larvae. But both, tree, both of these species, they haven't actually shown effectiveness on trees greater than 15 inches in diameter yet. And so right now, there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence that suggests these can be effective at keeping EAB larvae densities low. Um, in the case of Tetrasticus, basically in two inch to five inch trees, in the case of Spathius, up to 15 inch trees. But when we're looking at kind of larger diameter ash, um, right now, there's not a lot of evidence that these have been effective at pr pr protecting those. 
What is interesting is some work that's happened in Connecticut and New York and Massachusetts where both of these parasitoids are on the landscape. It does show they're complementary and what, what trees they actually are, are in, um, paras um, conducting parasitism on the larvae. And so over here, Spathius is really focused in on those, those, those larger trees, so as well as pole-sized trees, whereas the other organisms really just focusing on saplings. And so there's the opportunity for both of them to, to kind of be complementary on the same site if you were to choose those, those methods. The, this has been talked about quite a bit um, today, and, and I think it's just exciting just the amount of, of energy around this, and, and, and uh, it's no coincidence that, that John and I both have a picture of Les and, and Richard David around Ashley Collection. They literally have, they did write the book on this, and, and, and we gained so much knowledge from them on this, but really thinking about those future generations of ash, and certainly Emily's work um, in Maine and, and work that's happened elsewhere, in trying to collect seed um, while we still have the opportunities to do that, and so both while we still have mature ash on the site, as well as you know, while there are, this year is a tremendous seed year um, throughout the Northeast for ash. And so this September um, through October, being able to, to collect that seed, um, but not just collect it, but also document where it's coming from. So that as, as Tyler brought up, you know, we, the, there can be the opportunity to plant ash seedlings from the site that you're standing in today um, in the future. And so making sure you're matching um, to both the future conditions there um, with that material. There are both some, some regional efforts on the MAMA effort, as well as the, the growing Wabanaki efforts, as well as national efforts where, where there's a lot of information that can be gained around both who's collecting from where, how do you best um, store and process that seed and so forth. Likewise, um, although less um, you know, hopeful in terms of the opportunity to have the full experience with, with ash into the future, but nevertheless, there is growing momentum and interest around um, preserving future material from ash, even if we're unable to preserve large amounts of, of living ash in the near future, um, pounding out and collecting and storing large amounts of splint material so that there's, there's opportunities for future generations to work with that material, um, even when, while we're still trying to find ways to, to get mature ash back in the landscape. So this clearly you know, requires access, something that, that John uh, mentioned, and as well as you know, in many cases, these events, this is an event in the bottom right, this past May, where it was a, kind of a large group of individuals got together and pounded splints um, in Vermont um, for, for storage for the, for the Abenaki in Vermont, but giving access to places where these exist. And so um, I know land trusts here in Vermont are now developing what are known as cultural access agreements. Sounds like in, similar efforts are going on in Maine, but, but gain, gaining access to where both black ash are for, for pounding as well as for, for seed collection, I think is so critical um, for this. And then finally, just integrating many approaches. Again, um, Tyler's video really highlighted this, this well and that this is, this is definitely a novel threat. And each of these approaches I talked about have different strengths as well as different costs associated with them. And so in some cases, applying multiple approaches across the landscape might actually provide um, the best, best approach. And so, for example, when you're treating trees with insecticides, you know, those individual trees where insecticides are being applied um, you will not have EAB in those areas. And so they'll, they'll, they'll isolate themselves onto other trees where it might be easier for natural enemies like woodpeckers, as well as parasitoids to actually be more effective. And so kind of balancing those strategies across the site is pretty critical. I won't belabor it, but it is important to survey um, and know where EAB is or any of these threats around the landscape. That will inform kind of what strategy makes the most sense. And, and again, John and Tyler's presentation highlighted that nicely. And then I'll just reemphasize, you know, point that that John made, and, and, and that I think is hopefully clear as, as we talk across this issue is that um, it's been an unfortunate reason to build community across many different people, many different tribes, many different partners. But there's been a lot of power in that community in terms of sharing ideas and knowledge and, and kind of humility um, as we ad address this issue. And so it's it's been I feel really fortunate to have been part of this. Again, not the most most uh, as I guess. Uh, happy reason for, for motivating us, but, but nevertheless, it's, I think it's a powerful model going forward um, as we deal with other threats facing our forests and kind of and thinking through more broadly the cultural um, values that are impacted. So just to, to end again, um, you know, preservation of these species, you know, really can't happen everywhere. There are costs and certainly trade-offs associated with these approaches, but we do know, especially with ash at this point, um, there are some effective tools um, there's a lot of knowledge that's been gained um, over the over the decades from folks like Les and others, but also even in the last several years that if we have the opportunity, we should be trying these tools. 
And importantly, I think this, this community of knowledge and certainly opportunities like today um, where we connect around these issues are so important. And so thinking through how we, we deal with both Emerald Ash Border, but other threats that face our forest into the future, I think really, really relies on this community building and, 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 and leveraging our knowledge and, and values across, across communities. So I'll end with that and acknowledge the many people, um, including uh, again, John and Tyler for, for covering everything so well before me, so I could just re reinforce your, your points, but um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Tony D'Amato. That was an excellent presentation. I think there were some, some points that were consistent across the video, John's presentation and yours. And I think that just speaks volumes to the importance of some of the stuff that we're, we're talking about when we think about ash preservation and how significant the species is to um, tribal communities in the region, um, tribal nations in the region. Uh, I think it'd be good to, give a few minutes for questions and follow up to Tony. And while that's uh, occurring, I'm gonna pin everybody that uh, has presented, um, myself, John, Emily, and Tony, and we can uh, answer any questions from, from the group that have uh, been lingering. If there's a question that uh, came up earlier and you didn't get a chance to ask it, now would be the time to do so. So I did have one. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, 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 you're fine. Um, okay. Thank you, Patricia. So I don't know if this is um, a silly question or if it has already been covered somewhat and I didn't really pick up on it, but something that you said, Tyler, in the video, um, you know, has really stuck with me. Um, you mentioned that one of the big unknowns is whether the the seedlings that come up are going to have any kind of resistance to the emerald ash borer. And I was just wondering about if you thought of any potential strategies for protecting those younger trees as they advance, you know, into to larger sizes and what might be that really kind of comprehensive long-term strategy as as things are kind of playing out now. And that's a, a question for Tony or anybody else who has been thinking about this at end up. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. I'll 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 start. Um, I think uh, in the video, one of the comments I made was um, in reference to the stump sprouts and maybe injecting the stump. Would you see some chemical treatment in those stump sprouts that would make them protected against emerald ash borer? I don't think that's something that we know, but it would be a cool strategy to try and see if it would be a way to do just what you said and protect some of those smaller diameter uh, regenerating ash trees. Um, because that's a really important uh, aspect of, of uh, really any sound civil culture is you're planning for the next generation, I think. Um, and so if you're planning for the next generation and we know that emerald ash borer can attack trees that are small as two inches, um, it becomes very challenging. Um, so I think coupling things in an integrated approach are what I am most excited about. If we can bring in uh, some of the other strategies and integrate them into our approach. So we do silviculture, make it less likely that emerald ash borer will attack that site, but we're also uh, injecting some of the larger trees uh, as emerald ash borer nears the area so that they can maybe re remain on the site for a, a couple of seed uh, producing years beyond what it would if we didn't. And then the biocontrols, we can have a natural enemy on the landscape um, to fight a uh, uh, emerald ash borer off and keep their level their population levels lower um, maybe those trees would make it to adulthood um, and maturity rather John and Emily Tony if you have something to add to that 
I, I think it's a really good thought because sometimes it's oftentimes referred to as an orphan cohort, right? With the seedlings that are coming back, but then they get attacked and then you kind of basically lose your seed source. So paying attention to your seedlings that are returning makes sense to me, you know, in some way of protecting those, whether it's through looking at the effects of that chemical treatment or I don't know, maybe having some other kind of protector thing on, <laughs> on the seedling from EAD. But I think that's a really good thought. Um, Tyler, it looks like the question in the chat is a good um, segue into another topic. And you're on mute. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was going to say that was a good catch, and then I, I blundered it. So thanks, Emily. Yeah, uh, Anne uh, Herring McLeod writes, how much is known about the non-native parasitoid wasps in relation to their potential impacts on non-targeted species? Um, Tony, do you have a good familiarity with the process for which uh, these biocontrols got approved for release? Yeah, I mean, I have a, I have a, a rough familiarity with them by, by no means an expert. Um, but so if others have, have more familiarity with that, but but generally for, for any of these biocontrols to be approved um, by APHIS for, for release, they, they do a pretty exhaustive evaluation of potential um, non-target impact. That's, that's to say they, they don't, it still could be a possibility, but at least the screening and then some of the observations so far is that it hasn't had impact. And I think just to, to tie back to the earlier question is as much as the the non these parasitoids aren't as effective on like maintaining large mature ash they are seem to be pretty effective on on smaller um ash and so that the regeneration um it seems to be some of the work from like the like the lower peninsula michigan they've been pretty effective at keeping larval densities down on some um smaller smaller trees and so keeping that that cohort protected for a while but but yeah i'm not sure um if there's more recent work beyond the initial release just things that came out when they were releasing them but it seems they they do check, but it's similar to, I will say as well, MMEC and benzoate, there are no known non-target impacts, um, but that does not mean there aren't impacts. And so um, so I think there's always that to be to be cautious or at least be adaptive in, in how you apply those things. Um, one thing that is interesting about the biocontrols is how small they actually are. And when we hear the word wasp, I think a lot of people think of like the really scary killer wasps and things that, you know, have been in the pop culture recently about wasps. And it's really incredible. Um, Colleen Tierling with the state of Maine talks about how some of the wasps, they're like as small as the period on a page. They're very, very small. And John and I had the opportunity to um, take part in a release in Southern Maine last week or the week before, and they are very small. So it's not like a honeybee or, you know, a hornet or a larger insect. You would never notice them on the landscape, um, which doesn't mean that there couldn't potentially be an issue um for non-targeted species but it is also not what we think of when we generally think of what a wasp is which um uh is very interesting and uh it was amazing how small they actually were so that was really cool yeah thank you emily thanks tony um <clears throat> i guess I, I would just add that uh that's kind of bringing up a good point of how we share these strategies with the community. If there's, um, I mean, in science, there's no way to say for certain that the biological controls are not gonna have impacts on non-target species. Um, and we wanna be clear that that's the case. Um, there hasn't been any found evidence that that's the case, but we're also still in the early stages of seeing these biocontrols get established on the landscape. So. Um, it's an uncertainty, and I think it's a balance of uh, kind of addressing that uncertainty, acknowledging it, and then doing uh, an estimate of, of what your what's the risk, what's the risk of doing that, uh, this strategy. And um, I think that's an important battle that uh, tribal communities and tribal uh, natural resource staff will have to kind of address as they decide 
uh, if this is a strategy they want to see carried out. Mm -hmm. So if anyone else has any other questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself or throw it in the chat. Um, otherwise, I do have some panel questions here pre-written that I we can move through here before we conclude. Uh, so uh, what climate impacts in the Northeast region are most concerning for ash preservation? So this is, a, this is with the climate resilience program that you set. So we wanna make sure we think about climate change and the impacts that our ash trees are, are experiencing. Um, anyone have a climate impact in mind that, that comes right to the top when thinking about ash preservation? I, I think a lot about um, drought, you know, just given they're, they're often, especially in the wetland settings, shallow rooted and, and at least again, thinking broadly about the, the trigger of the, the, the ash decline that, that John mentioned was, was, was motivating um, some of that earlier work in Maine. I, I know some of the work that examined the similar decline in, in the lake states, it, it seemed to be drought was a bit of a predisposing factor um, in some areas there. So certainly, yeah. Uh, concern in those those wet sites yeah I, I think the drought but it's also I think the other extreme too with rain and water table levels getting too high which then makes it a stressor on the tree that I think uh, you know is also important I think I think that's also why it's important to have that inventory and monitoring <laughs> to kind of see, you know, what changes might be happening on the landscape as we see, you know, kind of climatic effects. We're, we're probably going to still see kind of die back. We have die back, you know, that occurs in our ash trees, but is it increasing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are there other kind of factors impacting the health of the brown ash besides EAB that might be tied to, you know, kind of climate change, change conditions? Absolutely. I, I also think about uh, snowpack and, um, you know, these are, they're in areas where the snowpack is sometimes minimal in small depression areas, but it's a really important um, thing when it's a shallow rooted wet site. Those root systems are really sensitive and if there isn't a snowpack to insulate the, the root systems just a little bit, we see a lot of frost damage on, on brown ash forest. And if that's going to be a secondary stressor on top of the impact that we, we're going to see with emerald ash borer, it can be a, a pretty significant. Um, we can see a lot of decline really quickly. And I think uh, we often hear that emerald ash borer prefers brown ash over the other ash species, but I think it, a lot of times it's because brown ash are just growing in such tough sites that they're already stressed, so they get we get emerald ash borer there so quickly and they can ravage uh, sites if, if they're not really healthy. <clears throat> so I think um, we're coming close to the end of the, of the top of the hour. I'm checking the chat here one more time. I'm not seeing any more questions roll in. I think it would be a good time to think about the writing reflections for today. I'm going to uh, share my screen again here. It says 10 minutes, but we're a little over on schedule. So I think I'll give everyone five minutes and it's not necessarily that you have to send one in, but just give it some thought here. Um, oh, I'm sharing the wrong, wrong PowerPoint here. Sorry about that. So there is a couple of uh, prompts on the checklist that people could focus on for a writing reflection. The first is, you know, one thing I learned from today's webinar was, you know, very open-ended, just finish that sentence. Uh, but the other were more directed toward this particular webinar. So addressing Emerald Ash Borer in the Dawnland, uh, the video, uh, Vice Chief Richard Silliboy, Master Basket Maker, I talked about the significance of brown ash to the Wabanoa Key. Uh, what element of significance for the brown ash tree stuck out to you the most and why? 
Um, and then in Tony D'Amato's presentation, integrated pest management of the emerald ash borer, numerous strategies for addressing emerald ash borer were shared. These strategies could have could prove useful in protecting a variety of culturally important plants, uh, whether it be for ash trees or some other significant resource in your community. Uh, how might you share these strategies uh, determine, to determine if the community supports them? Um, so I'll give a little bit of time for people to think about that, but if you have a reflection that you'd like to share with the group um, right away, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and share or uh, type it into the chat box and uh, share that way. Um, I, I'll share something real quick. One thing I learned from today's webinar, um, I didn't realize, uh, I did not realize until looking at the map of Maine, um, the large percentage of land uh, owned by corporations. And uh, that made me think a lot about, when we talk about partnerships and we talk about <clears throat> especially doing uh, management or responding to EAB, um, or protecting ash stands. It's not just, you know, private landowners or, um, and, and, and things like that. Um, you're dealing with kind of, I don't know the size of corporations, but uh, it, it, it adds another level of complexity, I'm sure, uh, in, in the partnerships. So that's one thing I learned. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially in the, the context of Maine, Maine's landscape. I mean, I feel like there's uh, more often than not, uh, not a federal or state adjacent landowner. It's a private corporation to tribal lands in Maine. So it's always challenging to try to facilitate a relationship to do some landscape level management um, when that's the case. Yeah, and I just add, I mean, it was partly driven too by the interests of the tribal communities because most of the harvesting that's done is on private land, not on tribal forest land. So having, having involvement of private landowners and, and including the large and private industrial landowners, which is up more in Northern Maine, closer to Mi'kmaq is really important. So. <clears throat> Another thing. To, another, go ahead. I was just going to say just another thing to mention, though, you know, when we've gone to visit some of these private landowners and looking for basket quality trees, um, they are always astounded by how many trees are passed up. <laughs> you know, the actual harvest of the brown ash that would be taking place on their land is very minimal. You would hardly even notice those trees missing, um, you know, and because of the, there's concern if there's a land um, conservation easement or other kind of things, but they're always, uh, you know, they've been, they've been a bit surprised um, at, in some cases, how rare it is to, to find, you know, basket quality brown ash. Hi, this is Jennifer Isherwood. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Jennifer. Hi, hi, Tyler. Um, from Emily's comment, I I learned um, you know about actually the size of the you know some of the parasitoid wasps that might be used in in treatments, and and it made me think about how important it is in the um, image or you know the the discussion of of treatments to people and and how when people think about oh you know we're going to release these insects and wasps and and how it really is important to explain, you know, um, what what these creatures <laughs> may end up looking like, or um, how they affect um, the landscape, you know, either visually or, um, you know, biologically. And it, it's a it's a key point because people do get, you know, upset <laughs> just by that term wasp. I think, and um, mm -hmm. so that I think that was a really interesting 
point and made me change to my view of, of that kind of treatment. So I appreciated that. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. I think that's uh, something that the state's always challenged with too, is uh, I think that they've tried to go away from calling them parasitoid wasps to sticking either to natural enemy or some other term that, that doesn't even bring that, that term in. And then when we can have a chance to do stuff like this and explain uh, a little bit more exactly what we're, we're talking about, uh, we have the ability to kind of talk it through a little bit better. Um, so that's a good point, really good point. I think the key to all of this is uh, involving the stakeholders when you're talking about introducing a non-native species uh, in this type of context and educating them, giving them all of the information. And, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't bother me, you know, the, the terms of parasitoid wasps, uh, because I'm coming at it, I'm actually a wildlife biologist and a veterinary epidemiologist. So, you know, the first thing I think is when I hear, you know, introducing any non-native species is, uh, you know, can we control it? What are these impacts going to be? And, uh, you know, are the impacts going to be more significant than the initial threat that we're trying to eliminate? So, you know, when you're talking about dealing with the general public and the stakeholders, um, you know, we, we get into these debates of how much information is too much information? And, you know, are we giving them enough information for them to make, uh, you know, decisions, especially if you're talking about private landowners on, you know, what types of treatments they may want to implement. So, um, you know, it's, it, I guess it can be a, a two-edged sword uh, when you're talking about, you know, it, you know, do we give them enough? Do we hold back some? Um, so that was, that was, uh, the basis of my initial question that I put in the chat. So, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you, Ann. That's a really great comment. Um, I think, it, you know, it kind of peels, peels away a little bit, but one thing I, I thought of when you're, you're sharing that involving stakeholders, um, you know, we have all these strategies that have a, a price tag associated with them. Uh, one thing that differed from uh, maybe my present or the video and uh, John's presentation and, and Tony's presentation was the dollar amounts that Tony put in about the injected insecticide. Um, I think that that's when you're talking about a private landowner, um, there's, a, there's a practicality to maybe some of these strategies in terms of preserving a species. And a lot of times the bottom line is if it's going to be economically feasible. Um, and I mean, I think that that's just a realistic thing to, to acknowledge. Um, and how do, how do we determine if it is um, economically feasible? We have to you know, balance what's the, the cost and what's the benefit, um, which you touched on really well there. I think uh, one thing that often gets overlooked when we think about the benefit are, are these, uh, you know, if, if we're, we're in a group here where the cultural significance of species is commonly talk, talked about. But, you know, outside of this webinar, those folks that don't hear that very often sharing that story, I think, maybe makes some people stop and reconsider, is this, is this a, a benefit that's way outweighing the cost, even of some of these strategies that are really pretty expensive um, and, and who, who can we get on board with doing some of the strategies to preserve this species if uh, if they know about that that value that they may not know about right now all right we are at the top of the hour here 
Um, I really appreciate everybody tuning in and sharing their reflections. Uh, any of these reflections that you type up and would like to send to me, remember this gets you one step closer to getting one of those incentive packages. I'm keeping track of the records on my end of things so that um, I can check it off as I get them in. Um, and again, my email is tevert.usetting.org. Uh, here on this last slide, you can see it just in case you need to write it down, but I should be in your inbox um, where I send all these invites to each session. So, uh, well, Ali, thank you, uh, everyone, for participating in the webinar. I'm looking forward to the rest of the webinars in this series. Um, I think it will be great to just hear from everybody and everyone who shares. It's, it's been really great so far. The next webinar in the series will be vernal pool mapping, best management practices, and assessing climate vulnerability. And that will occur next Monday on August 29th from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 to 3 p.m. Central. And we hope to see you all there. Uh, if you have any reflections, again, go ahead and send that to my email. Um, and this concludes webinar number two. Uh, I'll send along a follow-up email with uh, all the slides from today's presentations and a recording of uh, today's webinar session. Uh, and if you find somebody who could benefit from today's webinar and you'd like to share it with them, please feel free to forward it along uh, so we can uh, make sure they get to it. Well, Ali, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. See ya. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tyler. Take care. You too. Hey, Tyler, I'm just going to stay on for a moment. And then once everyone hops off, I'll save the chat and the recording. Sounds good. Thank you, Casey. The, the handoff 4 p.m. is the the great handoff from mom to dad <laughs> so, <laughs> nice that's, <laughs> that's right that's where I went for a second I'm like oh it's four she's got to help on a meeting so <laughs> pretty good um I'm just going to go ahead and uh uh save the chat I, I see uh so Dan Atkins still on, but um, I'll save the chat and do uh, save the recording and we'll upload it. So I'm going to end the meeting for all. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. I'll uh, keep an eye uh, out in the email for a link to it in the resource center and I can get in touch with communications to get it processed. All right. Sounds good. All right. Take care, Casey. Take care.